Okay, so the next set of videos that we're going to do is, is really around what other information can we get from the periodic table. So this topic of what information we can get, we call this periodicity. Okay, and so under periodicity, there's actually six things that we can take a look at. So those topics are effective nuclear charge. We can take a look at atomic radius. We can take a look at ionic radius. Okay, and then uh, the next three, we would take a look at ionization energy. Electron affinity. And then the sixth one is going to be electronegativity. So those are the six properties that we're going to take a look at. Now, we're going to, the way that we're going to divide this up, we're going to, on this video, we're going to take a look at the first three, effective nuclear charge, atomic radius, and ionic radius. The next video, we're going to look at the last three, ionization energy, electron affinity, and electronegativity. Now, all of these are covered in some way, shape, or form inside your chapter. The only one that isn't is the last one, electronegativity, which is actually in the next chapter when we start talking about covalent bonding. So what I'm going to do with that last one is introduce it now on, a, on the basis of this is what you need to know in order to move on. But then after, uh, you know, we'll, we'll spend a little bit more time talking about electronegativity once we start talking about covalent bonding. All right. So that being said, let's get started. Let's talk about the six properties that we can find on the periodic table. So the first one that we can talk about is called effective nuclear charge. Now, before we can even talk about that, we got to go back to an idea in the last chapter that I, um, I kind of brought up, but then like put it aside very quickly. And that's called the shielding effect of the many electron system. And here's the idea behind the shielding effect, that the further the electrons are away from the nucleus, the less attraction And for attraction, if we're going to be more specific about this, uh, attraction in chemistry is called electrostatic attraction. The electron has towards the nucleus. Okay, so let me read that one more time. The further the electrons are away from the nucleus, the less attraction the electron has towards the nucleus. So as you, you're in the N equals 5, 6, 7, and so on, as you get further and further away from the nucleus, you start to lose the attraction towards the nucleus, which means it becomes easier to remove you because you don't feel that attraction. You don't, you don't, have, that, you don't have that urge to stay within the nucleus. And so what we're looking at in this picture, we're looking at the radius or the radial probability for these different orbitals, okay? So we're looking at distance from the nucleus on the x-axis and then the probability of where we're going to necessarily find these electrons. So if we look at the maxima points on each of these curves, these are most likely the area that we're going to find those electrons. And so... As we keep increasing, as we go from 1s to 2s and 2s to 2p, eventually those electrons are going to get further and further away. Now, the 2p electrons are going to be a little, are held a little bit more tighter in towards uh, the nucleus than the 2s electrons. But if we go to n equals 3 or n equals 4, those electrons are going to get further and further and further away. And eventually, these curves are going to get more and more and more flatter. 
Okay, so looking at effective nuclear charge allows us to account for the effects of shielding on periodic properties. So if we take a look at helium, because helium is the next simplest electro, uh, next si simplest system, you've got two protons and you've got two electrons, and we know that the electronic configuration is 1s2. So what happens here is that the 2 plus charge of the nucleus is set off by electron-electron repulsion so that the 1s electrons shield each other from the nucleus. So think of it this way. You've got you've got you've got electrons going around, right? As you get further and further and further away from the nucleus, you've got those inner more electrons shielding or blocking you from feeling a, you know, getting a part of that nucleus or feeling something towards that nucleus. So as you get further and further and further away, you don't feel it because you got all these electrons blocking you. But if we look at electrons at in the same orbit like or orbital like like helium you've got two electrons in the 1s orbital you've got that other electron that's blocking you so not only are you getting electrons blocking you as you go further and further out but you've got electrons that are blocking you inside as well okay and so we can actually calculate this we can calculate the the effective nuclear charge, which is the charge felt by an electron by using this equation. So we say that the Z, which is the effective nuclear charge, ZF, is going to be equal to the atomic number Z minus a sigma, which sigma, this is actually a shielding constant. Okay, so again, Z this is the atomic number. And then sigma is the shielding constant. Do you have to calculate these? No, absolutely not. But I just want to show you where this is, you know, if you had to, this is where it's coming from. Now, if you have three or more electrons, the outermost electrons are going to be shield, shielded from electrons in the inner shell, but not the reverse. And so at the end, we've got this periodic table. A simple periodic table and what I would recommend for this section draw your own periodic table and keep track of these trends that we're talking about so effective nuclear charge increases as you go from bottom to top of a of a family or group and it also increases as you go from left to right across a period okay so that's effective nuclear charge so now that we've talked about effective nuclear charge, let's talk about the next one, atomic radius. The way that we define atomic radius, okay, atomic radius is half the distance between two nuclei and two adjacent metal atoms. or in a diatomic molecule. So let's say you've got two hydrogens next to each other. You would measure it from nucleus to nucleus. You take half of that distance, that's going to be the atomic radius. Okay. All right, so atomic radius is going to be determined by the strength of the attraction between the nucleus and the outermost electrons. And something to keep in mind as we look at this. Keep in mind that the stronger the effective nuclear force, the stronger the hold the electron has on the nucleus,
the smaller the radius. So we can actually take a look at this, you know, look at how this looks on the periodic table. An atomic radius will increase as you go from top to bottom. So as you go down a family or a group, and it's also going to increase as you go right to left across a period. So it's going to be absolutely opposite of effective nuclear charge. Okay. So that's kind of nice. Effective nuclear charge is going to be the opposite of what you see for atomic radius. Okay, so that being said, what is the difference between atomic radius and ionic radius? So ionic radius is going to be the, re the radius of, an, of a cation or an anion. Okay, and so in order, so when we have a neutral atom, So when a neutral atom forms a cation or an anion, there has to be a change in size. Okay. And we tend to find that cations tend to have a smaller radii because remember they're losing electrons. And anions tend to have a bigger radius because they're gaining electrons. Okay. And so we're kind of seeing that in this picture over here. Here's a normal lithium atom, neutrally charged. Here's a normal neutrally charged fluorine atom. But once you transfer that valence electron from lithium to fluorine, the lithium ion shrinks, or it gets smaller because you've lost that N equals 3 energy level. The fluoride ion becomes larger because you've gained that one electron, and now it's going to be isoelectronic with that of neon. Okay? And lithium is also going to be isoelectronic with that of helium. All right. So... The way that I the way that I, ionic radius works is that if we let's take a look at two families. So here's family one a. Here's family one a, and here's the radius, the atomic radius for lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, and cesium. So it tends to increase as we go from bottom from top to bottom of the period of that of that family, and so if we look at the radii. These numbers tend to be shifted about 100 picometers, okay? So here's, again, that difference between lithium and the lithium ion. It looks like it's going to be 100 picometers smaller. But that trend still increases as we go from top to bottom, okay? Now for, and that, were, that was for family 1A. Now let's take a look at family 7A the halogens. So in red, here's the atomic radii for fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine. And if we take a look, it looks like, again, you're close to a 100 picometer change here between fluorine and the fluoride ion. So now the, the, the radius for, the, for family 7A is larger. Okay. So what we tend to see on the periodic table is that the radius increases as you go from top to bottom for a family or a group, but for a period, it becomes a little bit more complicated. So if you notice on family three, on period three, if we start with gallium, it starts at 62, then it goes to 83, and then the numbers kind of vacillate between 60 to 90, and then eventually it becomes, it gets bigger as you get to the representative elements again. So that being said, it's a little bit, uh, the trend is that it tends to increase when you're going 
from right to left, but it's hard. It's, it's a little bit harder to see. So when I tend to ask this question on exam, like which, you know, compare the two atoms and which one is going to have a higher atomic radius, I tend to not ask that question because for an ionic radius, it does get a little bit more confusing. So I tend to stay away from that. But effective nuclear charge and atomic radius, fair game. I can definitely ask that question. So let me ask, before we uh, say goodbye to these topics, let me, let me ask about one more thing. What about the variations of physical properties across a period or within a family? So it tends to go, if we look at a period, and let's say we start with period three. It starts with metals, okay? And then as we go from family 1A and 2A and into the transition metals, so eventually as we go from left to right, it starts to lose its metallicity. So it becomes more of a metalloid, okay? So it has properties of metals and non-metals. And then eventually, once we leave that metalloids away, then it becomes non-metal, okay? And what's kind of neat, if you study this, if you take a look at the elements in a period, the transitions are pretty, I mean, they, they're not like, they're gradual. They, it's not like instantaneous metal versus non-metal. But it actually flows. So like you start with very reactive metal to very unreactive or not very reactive metal to a more of a metalloid to, uh, you know, a not very reactive non-metal to a very reactive metal, non-metal. So it's a very gradual transition. Okay. So again, the way I said that, you had a very reactive metal. to not so reactive, to a metalloid, to a not so reactive re, uh, non-metal, to a very reactive non-metal. Okay. But if we take, and keep in mind that that's for a period, if we take a look at a family, the properties are more predictive, especially if the elements are in the same state. And so with that, the next video we're gonna take a look at is the last three properties, ionization energy, electron affinity, <coughs> excuse me, and, and electronegativity.